Look, most of you guys know by now that I follow politics very heavily. For the last few months, it seems everyone from the president to your grandma has been talking about this group of people called uh, the squad. Like even Amanda Waller seems to know who they are. Bring them back or I'm calling in the squad to put them down. So I finally sat down, crunched the numbers, and I figured it out. I have the true identities of the squad. That's right, I'm about to reveal live on air just exactly who the squad is. Carmelo, code name, Pulverizer. Point man, center force. Spin drive. We're the hoop squad. because it's Thursday. Hello, Watchtower Database, and welcome back to The Vanishing Point, the only bi-weekly YouTube show that dissects small chunks of the DCAU timeline to answer questions you probably never thought to ask. Have you guys ever thought about how well the premise of Static Shock would have fit into the Cadmus arc and just gotten yourself mad about it? Like, think about it. An experimental gas that's used to give teenagers superpowers at random? Step aside, Hugo Strange, and when Alva is now on the board of Cadmus. Not to mention the Hoop Squad, a team of NBA all-stars turned superheroes, was totally created by some shadow government agency. Their main enemy was heavily versed in nanotech, which is right up Cadmus's alley. There's honestly a lot to work with here, and with Dwayne McDuffie having a writing credit on almost every Cadmus-centric episode, it's a surprise that he didn't try to bring the world of static in just a little bit more. But that's all besides the point. We're not talking about Hoop Squad today, we're talking about the Suicide Squad. I'm sure that we can all agree that Task Force X is one of the best episodes of the Cadmus arc, but something that I just picked up on recently while re-watching the episode is that besides their civilian names and their villain names, everybody on the team also has a code name. For instance, with Rick Flagg, This is X1. We've reached checkpoint A. Then moments later, he identifies the Clock King as, Need that backup plan, X4. And and then the Clock King goes on to reveal the codename of Plastique. X3, you have 28 seconds. Do not be late. However, the episode leaves us without code names for Captain Boomerang and Deadshot. It's easy enough to assume that one would be X2 and the other X5, but which is which? And why? Well, you know the drill. The answer lies in the timeline. If you'll recall, the episode begins with Deadshot being recruited to the team while he's on his way to the electric chair. Being the newest member, of the team, he believes himself to be a free man once the mission is over. And, well, that doesn't go over too well. Five years. You sign up for missions like this for five years. We've established before in our Justice League Unlimited timeline video that this season of the show takes place in summer of 2003, with this episode specifically taking place on Memorial Day. Well, look at this. Esposito's actually on time for a change. Didn't have to drop the kids at school. Memorial Day. <laughs> So, with every Task Force X member being forced to serve for five years, this places Deadshot on the team until Memorial Day of 2008. While this is the only episode that we see the squad all together, that bit about the five years is repeated by another member of the team later on. During Flash and Substance, an episode from the next season, which is set in spring of 2004, we get this little back and forth between the Flash's rogues. We heard you were out early. Time off for good behavior, you might say. I cut me a good deal. Got my sentence down to five years, and now they tell me I'm reformed. Without the context of Task Force X, it might be easy to miss that Boomerang's good behavior comment is in regards to signing on with the team and doing missions with them for five years. Which is kind of weird to think about to me. Like, Batman's villains are just in and out of jail like a revolving door, but Boomerang did something so bad that he thinks that joining Task Force X is worth the commuted sentence? What, what did he even do? Reformed? The man who robbed an entire fleet of armored cars in one month? 
Now that was a crime. Sounds like Gotham's justice system might need just a little bit of reform. But with all signs pointing to this having been a reference to Boomerang's time with Task Force X, this would mean that he joined the team in spring of 1999, way back during the Superman the Animated Series New Batman Adventures part of the timeline. And of course, this checks out with what we already know about Cadmus. As confirmed by General Hardcastle in Fearful Symmetry, Volcana, who first debuted in Superman the Animated Series Where There's Smoke, was also also a part of Cadmus. And then returning to the only top 10 video we've ever done on this channel, the number three best bath of the DCAU gives us this information. Amanda Waller, born in East St. Louis, Rhodes Scholar, PhD in political science, served in intelligence under three administrations, disappeared from public life four years ago. You know, Maybe we should do a couple more top 10 videos. Top 10 living rooms, top 10 newspaper headlines, top 10 critters. That's a good one. James, write it down. We're doing top 10 critters. Doomsday Sanction, the episode that that clip was from, is another episode that takes place in 2003. So Amanda Waller's dropping out of public life four years ago lines up exactly with Captain Boomerang's recruitment to Task Force X. Yeah, yeah, so we all knew that Captain Boomerang was a member of the squad before Deadshot was. I mean, he was already there in the room when Deadshot showed up. So obviously, Boomerang is X2 and Deadshot is X5 right? Well, if that's what you're thinking, you're on the right track. But how can we be sure that the other members of the team joined in numerical order? With an info dump. That's how. Out of the remaining members of the team, the only one that we really know anything about prior to this episode is Temple Fugit, the Clock King. Looking at the back of his action figure for the Mattel Justice League Unlimited line, we can learn that Recently, he was recruited by Amanda Waller to serve as strategist for Project Cadmus Strike Force Task Force X. The force is a force, of course, of course, unless that force is named Mr. Ed. While we aren't given a specific year in which he was recruited, we do know that it was at least within the past two years due to his appearance in Batman Adventures Volume 2, number 12, which is a comic run that we've already established before takes place during the original Justice League show, with this in particular taking place in summer of 2001. So this would all place Fugit on the team until at least the summer of 2006. Colonel Flagg, on the other hand, we know to be a member of the US military, and unlike the rest of the team, isn't a criminal trying to win his freedom. Tell me, Colonel, what's Waller got on you? Not a thing. Some of us don't have to be blackmailed into serving their country. It makes sense that he's been around since the very start of the team and actually helped Amanda Waller put it together. But in addition to that, Rick. You're a good soldier. Your father would be proud. While comic book continuity doesn't always line up with DCAU continuity, in the comics, Rick Flagg's father, Rick Flagg Sr., led a group who would come to be known as the Suicide Squadron during World War II. And later on in the 1950s, he would start the original Task Force X under the supervision of President Harry S. Truman following the abrupt retirement of the entire JSA. We've established before that Waller didn't make her way into public life until sometime during Reagan's administration in the 80s. So her involvement with Rick Flagg Sr., as well as his history altogether in the DCAU, seems a little bit less clear. But at the very least, it seems as though Rick Flagg Jr.'s involvement with Task Force X was as some sort of a legacy candidate. Admittedly, we know next to nothing about the team's final member. Plastique. She only appeared in this one episode and then seemingly died at the end. I mean, it was one of those open-ended deaths and we all know that Bruce Timm said, Section 94D, paragraph 12 of the Supervillain Code clearly states, and I quote, unless a corpse is actually shown, pronounced dead, and subsequently buried or cremated, said villain cannot under any circumstances be considered to be deceased, unquote. But at the same time. I heard we lost plastic. Yes, ma'am. You'll have my full report by 0800. Dead or not, there's not much we can be sure of here. She didn't even get an action figure that we can read the back of. However, we do know how teams work, and Colonel Flagg recruiting and working with only Captain Boomerang for a couple of years doesn't seem like much of a team. So it would only make sense that Plastic has also been around since basically the start, or close to it, which honestly puts a sad footnote on her death because she was 
so close to freedom and well this happened say la vie. Oh look, she got to die right next to her comics continuity husband. How sweet. Plastique. Always in our hearts, but never on our shelves because they won't give us a goddamn action figure! Hashtag justice for plastique. <laughs> so yes, Deadshot is very likely X5, and Captain Boomerang is very likely X2 X-Men United. The thing that I'm curious about though, and not too sure if there is an answer for, is with Boomerang and Plastique now being off the team, do the numbers numbers change at all? Like, does Clock King go from being, what, X3 down to X2? Deadshot from X5 down to X3? That's not where the history of Task Force X ends, though. As we've pointed out before in our What Really Happened When the Joker Died episode, the team did eventually end up getting a new recruit in Harley Quinn, who was likely a part of the team until around 2009, which all timeline clues currently point to affecting her appearance in Return of the Joker. But for more on that, you can click and watch this video up here. Also in the comic that hinted towards Harley's future spot on the team, we were given confirmation that Killer Croc is now a part of Task Force X as of fall of 2003, with Deadshot, Captain Boomerang, and Rick Flagg all still being members of the team, and Clock King being strangely missing for some reason. It's possible that Killer Croc had been recruited after the events of Task Force X as a replacement for Plastique, but we were never given anybody's code names in this comic, so who's to say? Maybe, maybe he's X0. Now that I have all of that laid out for you, my question of the day is, which DCAU character that didn't get an action figure do you think should have? Obviously, Plastique is up in the running, but I would also be interested in some stat Shock or Zeta figures. I think being specific, Ebon would probably be my top choice, but I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. So as always, leave your thoughts down under in the Australia box. Before I go, I want to be sure to thank all of these lovely people who have helped support us on Patreon this month. If your name's not on the list and you want to get it on there, you can head over to patreon.com slash DCAU Watchtower and we'll get it on the next one for a pledge of as low as a dollar. But while you're over there, you can check out other tiers to see the other goodies that we offer, including live stream hangouts, custom artwork, merch, and more. But speaking of merch, if you want to grab a shirt but don't want to become a monthly patron, you can always go to our Teespring store and grab one for a one-time buy. The link's down there in the description. You can click on it. It's the one that says teespring.com slash something or other. Um, I've never bothered to learn the link. All this being said, I've been Maddie Washburn. This has been The Vanishing Point, and we will continue to stay those things so long as you continue to stay you. I will see you in two weeks, unless you're not subscribed, and then you're not gonna see me until YouTube's algorithm pushes me back into your recommended feed. But if you would like to see me in two weeks, then you can hit the subscribe button, you can hit the little bell notification, you can... Bop it, twist it, you know, all of those things. Whether you're subscribed or not though, I'm glad you guys are here. Love you very much. And I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye.